My name is Mary Elaine, but I go by Elaine. Um, I am a, a nurse navigator in the Infusion Center. Could everybody hear okay? Um, and my actual job involves the drug Lemtrada um, and coordinating Lemtrada, but this presentation is about all of the medications that people with MS may have. And um, I am a registered nurse. I don't prescribe but um, I really help the patients navigate through the process. And rather than be a prescriber, I'm more of a coach and a facilitator to people when they're going through uh, treatment with Lemtrada. And um, so we'll get started here. Oh, before I get too involved, I wanted to, I'm gonna be doing two different speeches, and this one is the first, the second one will be in September. And I thought a good way to talk about the advancement in therapies is to go way back in time. Um, there's a lot of interesting history in MS. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of MS. Um, the history of how it was diagnosed and treated. Um, then after that, we'll go into a little bit about what really changed the game in MS. And really, some of those things are healthcare in general. Um, then we'll talk about the disease-modifying therapies, um, and then a little bit about shared decision-making, and then we'll finish with questions, um, and then your input about suggestions for what you would like for, for me or other people to talk about in the future, um, as I'm going to be doing one on advanced therapies part two, maybe if you have any ideas about what you would want me to bring to you. Um, so the history of diagnosis and treatment, um, there's a picture of me right after I got out of nursing school. Um, uh, that was about 40 years ago, so it's changed a little bit. Um, so the first, probably, and this is under dispute, but probably one of the first patients uh, diagnosed with MS was a young lady, um, her name was Ludwina and she lived in Holland, and she was born in 1380, and she lived until 1433. At the age of 15, she developed a mysterious illness where she was in bed for a while, she recovered, and then she got up and went to ice skate, and she fell on the ice. After she fell, she had a progressive disease, and it involved difficulty walking, tooth pain, which is probably trigeminal neuralgia, and some visual loss. And um, she was viewed as incurable because in that culture, disease was caused by the hand of God. It wasn't really a physiologic thing. Now, some people think she may not have had it, um, but she was canonized as, and she became a saint because she uh, took her disease and accepted it, feeling like it was God's plan for her, and she, that was the only thing she could do was accept it. Another person was Augustus Dieste, and he was born in England in, 19, or in 1794. It's so hard to say 17. Um, and he was the grandson of King George III, only his uh, mother's uh, marriage was annulled, so he didn't get full king benefits, but he still lived a pretty good life. And he loved to journal and write diaries. Um, and his diaries told the story of a relapsing and remitting course of disease. Um, he had visual, sensory, intermittent to progressive paralysis. He had bladder issues and erectile dysfunction. And he had access to treatments because he was still wealthy, and so the doctors would try anything. And so they tried hydrotherapy, horseback riding, um, strychnine, that doesn't sound very good, quinine, silver nitrate, and diet. Now, you will look at all of these older treatments, and they had way more treatments than we have now, but they really probably didn't work. And when you think of the relapsing or remitting nature of the disease, Dr. Jones will give somebody strychnine and then they have a remission and it was the drug and so he is real happy about it. So over the course of, the t of time though, this young man did have progressive disease 
and um, but a lot of the doctors thought his disease was due to external forces. Um, they didn't really look for, uh, they didn't really have any idea what was going on in his body. Then Heinrich Hein was a German poet, and being a poet, he wrote a lot. Um, an ophthalmologist applied leeches for the treatment of blindness, and there was some improvement. Well, it was just, tr it was just uh, optic neuritis that spontaneously abated. The leeches supposedly helped. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. That's not in our bag of tricks. You won't hear me talking about that. Um, other treatments include spas, purges, sulfur baths, bloodletting, morphine, iodine mixtures, laxatives, diets, enemas, and ointments applied to the, uh, they would put an incision in the back of the neck and put an ointment to draw the bad humors out. Um, his wife was getting so perturbed, uh, and any spouses here that was so perturbed about all the stuff that they were putting him through, um, he criticized her care and she gave him a black eye. So um, that was really kind of interesting. She was very frustrated. Margaret Gaddy was an author of children's books and she lived from 1809 until 1874. And um, she was tried on all kinds of different things and she really was unsure of the doctor's ability to make a decision. And she wrote in one of her, her uh, journals, still mu one must believe that the doctors know something. Um, she probably had her doubts. And her original notes included symptoms, uh, this is what the doctor said. His name was Dr. Chambers, I believe. Uh, he wrote that she had symptoms of a nervous, nervous disorder, but she's organically sound. So it was probably attributed to her being a nervous Nellie or something. Her trigeminal neuralgia, which wasn't diagnosed, but probably was now in retrospect, was so severe that she insisted her teeth all be pulled for the pain. And um, in one of her doctor's notes, he attributed her problems to the fact that she, uh, her extreme physical exertion, because she was digging in the garden uh, using masculine instruments. So it was all because of what she was doing. It wasn't that there was any disease. Um, so this is the man who gave MS the name, Jean-Martin Charcot. Um, Charcot, there were about 13 maybe doctors that preceded him, but he gave it a name so he gets the credit. Um, he was a French physician and his, the years he lived were 1825 to 1893. He was a student of Duchesne, you've heard of Duchesne's muscular dystrophy. He was an instructor of Babinski. Have you heard of Babinski reflex? And he had a significant influence on Freud. Um, Freud, both of them were neuro uh, psychologists, but of course Freud went more the psych way and Charcot went more of the um, neuro way. Um, so several physicians, as I said, they preceded him and followed him in the early work of MS research, but he gave it the name. And I was born in Newark, Ohio. I'm not really good at pronouncing things, French things, but it, I don't know if it's sclerose and plaque disseminé. Anybody take French? So you'll have to pardon my Midwest upbringing. Um, so that's the name that he gave it, and that looks pretty much like what we call it now. Um, he was a skilled illustrator. His brothers and sisters made comments about he doodled all the time. And so that skilled illustrating capacity really helped him in his medical diagrams that he made later. This is a picture of him in the lecture hall. Now, he wouldn't come to your bed if you were in the hospital to see you. You were brought to him and, th and the medical student would kind of deal with you and he would ask questions to the medical student to ask you. So his bedside manner was probably a lot different than our doctors. I, I don't think we would really enjoy his company. Um, and so this is him here and this is the woman who's brought up. So, um, but that was kind of the way it was then um, in academic medicine in Paris, France. 
um, so the hospital where he practiced had, uh, it was Salpetriere Chapel, and it is still, that's, the, that's still there, and it's in Paris, France, and it's a big medical center still. Um, but that's just the old part of the center. This building itself had a lot of history. First, it was an arsenal. That's why it's called Salpetriere, because of the saltpeter used to make ammunitions. And then it became a prison, I believe, and then it was, it just kind of evolved until eventually it became a, a facility that housed about 5,000 people in the 1800s. So here there are 5,000 people, there's a few doctors. Um, Charcot liked to look at people and sort out what they had. And he, he sorted and classified disorders, and then he'd watch people over time, and then when he died, he'd do an autopsy and find out what was there, and he would put symptoms with the autopsy. And that's how he came up with multiple sclerosis. And there was one lady that intrigued him so much that he hired her to be his maid, and she probably had multiple sclerosis too. And, and then he just observed her behavior over time. And so he would, he would just make these beautiful drawings. I, I could, because of copyright laws, I couldn't put them up here, but he was really a good uh, illustrator. Um, and so um, I, I went over, he, that hospital housed 5,000 patients. Now, I can't imagine what the conditions would be like. Uh, he observed them over time, sorting and classifying them. He performed autopsies and correlated the findings with symptoms. Other doctors didn't really correlate with symptoms that much. So he was what we would call a, um, the others were anatomic pathologists and he was more of a clinical pathologist. Um, and then he borrowed German techniques of microscopy uh, and staining technique to look at, to see what was going on. And he found that there were glial cells in there that were looked like they were doing damage to the nerves. So in 1868, uh, he had three lectures that had to do with multiple sclerosis. And when you consider in the 1800s, people didn't communicate like they do now. But when these lectures came out, people came from out from the woodwork. Other doctors from other countries said, well, I have a patient like that. I have a patient like that. I have a patient like that. And so people started recognizing that this was a problem. And an interesting thing about Charcot is that he noticed the difference in uh, uh, increase in prevalence of women to men. And some people discounted that, thinking that, that it was just that there were more women in this facility. But the, his numbers are pretty much the same with relapsing remitting as what we see now. So the game changers. Well, what's happened between then and now? Well, fortunately, a lot of things. Humoralism. Even though that came from Hippocrates in the 400 BCs, humoralism still predominated medicine. We had the, the four humors, blood, uh, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile that were associated with different seasons and treatments uh, were meant to balance the humors. And, um, and there really wasn't a disease per se, it was just your personal imbalance of humors. The good thing about this kind of medicine is it was very personalized because the doctor didn't really think of you as any, as a disease. It was like, well, you might have a little bit too much phlegm or you might have a little bit of blood, too much blood, so I'm gonna fix you by balancing things out. Well, we gradually went to the scientific method. So thank goodness we're in the scientific method now, where you observe a condition, you develop a question, you formulate a hypothesis, you experiment, analyze, and conclude. Well, we gradually went into scientific method, and that's where we are now. We still need that individual care for everybody. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm going to talk about that later, but we held on to the the Hippocrates theories of medicine for many years. And in fact, Galen, who followed him, said, well, his science is so perfect, we don't need to change anything. 
Galen lived, I think, until like 200 AD. It's, it's it, you know, it's the final, the end, that's medicine. So um, these are some big things. The first MRI in 1981, huge deal. That was during my career. Uh, look at a CAT scan, it's normal. Look at an MRI, several lesions. Um, Professor McDonald, the McDonald criteria, he gives guidelines for how to stage, how aggressive the disease is, and how to monitor treatment. Um, McDonald just recently revised, even though he died in 2006, his criteria were revised in 2017. Um, th these are big things. Neurofilament light chains are something that may be coming down the pike. It's a blood test that you could do to help gauge disease activity. Uh, Dr. Um, Nicholas has spoken on that in a lot of conferences. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I've just recently seen a neuro-ophthalmologist, mm -hmm. and he was talking about the fact that um, there's something that he looked at in my eyes, and he was like, this is the big new thing for diagnosing MS, and it, it's less expensive than an MRI. Yes. It's more definitive than everything, and the machine costs thousands of dollars less than an MRI mm -hmm. machine. Mm -hmm. The OCTs. Yes. That, yes, I yes, what yes. Instead, yeah, the OCTs, and we do those here, too, and it's... And it was like, and he was like, and you haven't had any change since mm -hmm. such and such date, and it's like, and I, it's like, this is like humongously great, it's like, look at the graph here, you're like, you have almost no change, it's like, yay! And I would not, and you know, when I started as a nurse, I would have never thought that they'd ever do that in a doctor's office, ever. Okay, about the diagnosis of looking at the uh, optic nerve and the OCT screening that we do here in the clinic. So, um, pharmacologic advances. We have borrowed from other disciplines. These are some of the areas that we have borrowed from. Cancer therapy. Uh, a monoclonal antibodies have been used for cancer. Interferons have been used for cancer. Um, and then some of the agents that I'm going to be talking about now were initially used for cancer therapy. Uh, rheumatology, we've used um, a lot of things through rheumatology uh, that have been developed. Um, and then transplant medicine. Um, when you think, well, Lemtrada was a cancer drug. Uh, Transplant, they've tried Cellcept in the past. They've tried um, Imuran in the past. Uh, and rheumatology and transplant kind of go close together because they all have to do with the immunologic system. Well, really, they all do. Um, advocacy is a big thing now with MS. And this woman really changed the game for a lot of us uh, by she, she was the sister of a man who was diagnosed with MS, and his name was Bernard, and she published uh, an ad in the New York Times saying, anybody with multiple sclerosis who has recovered, please contact the patient, and over 50 replies, but no one had recovered but they were people who cared. And she was a mover and a shaker, and she got things going, and she was the founder of what is now the Multiple Sclerosis Society, and that's her picture. So she's a mighty woman. You know, she, that, that, was, the, that was an individual moving a mountain, and, um, and we owe a lot to her. Um, the philosophy of medicine has changed a lot over the years, even in the course of my career. Paternalism was the old way. This is what you're going to get. I'm going to give you this treatment. You're going to have this. This is the best from you. I know it all. And if you don't like it, that's it, because that's what you're going to get. That's paternalism. Um, now we respect patients' autonomy and patients' choice in therapy. And we recognize that everybody's unique. And with MS, everybody's disease is unique. Your bodies are unique, and different people require different mechanisms of action. 
So these are big things. Uh, but I remember a day when the doctors didn't even want us to give patient information about the medication because they were afraid they'd get worried and there'd be a lot of questions. And But now, that's not our job. Our job is to tell you what is going on, what the studies show, what we recommend, and then you have a right to make your decision. And what have we learned about MS over the years? This is something that came from this book that I've really used a lot in developing this course, uh, this uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Jock Murray is a, um, a neurologist in Halifax. He runs an MS clinic, and he is also a uh, medical humanities professor. And this book is so full, this is all just the history of MS and all the people that were involved in making the history. Um, and he came up with this, and this is pretty much what I hear Dr. Boster uh, and Dr. Nicholas say. We have learned that the individuals are predisposed. We know that there must be a trigger. We know there is a damage to the blood-brain barrier uh, that results in myelin damage and axon damage. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, but we still have a lot we have to learn. So we're still, we are still not there, but we are trying. Um, the disease-modifying therapies. So we have pills, and we have injections, and we have infusions. And this last, what would you say, Susan, week? Last week was the first time ever. So it was on Wednesday, uh, we have one new drug called uh, Mayzent released, it's a pill, and then on Friday we had another new drug called Mavenclad released in that amount of time. I finished these slides on Tuesday and they were already outdated. <laughs> so I think that's good. I want it to be that way. If we're moving forward, it's going to be that way. You guys just hang in, have to hang in with us. Um, recap of the immune reaction. This is kind of the baseline. We have lymphocyte cells. We have B cells and T cells. We have inflammatory Bs and anti-inflammatory Bs. We have inflammatory Ts, anti-inflammatory Ts, and then we have immune proteins such as cytokines. Some promote inflation, uh, inflation. Inflammation and some uh, are anti-inflammatory. And I'm not going to get involved really deeply with the immune system because it is, for one thing, it's over my head. And I think that a lot of people, unless you're an immunologist like our doctors are, it's so complicated. There are so many uh, different chemicals. But basically you have blood and the blood-brain barrier and then the brain. Well you get inflammation in the blood-brain barrier, and then that lets lymphocytes and proteins into the brain that normally wouldn't go in there, and then they attack. So this, these are the different drugs. We have interferons, and there's a lot of interferons, and that was the first drug that we had introduced in 93. Um, they decrease the disruption of the blood-brain barrier, and they increase the production of anti-inflammatory cells and cytokines or proteins. Then we have the Copaxone-type drugs, um, and th these are self-injectables. It, it's thought to shift the immune system in the direction of anti-inflammatory from pro-inflammatory. And then we have pills. We have uh, Gelenia traps the lymphocytes in the lymph tissue. Fewer lymphocytes are available in the bloodstream, so fewer are able to go into the, into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Then we have abagio. Uh, it inhibits an enzyme that's needed for T and B cells to function. It doesn't kill the cells, but decreases their prolifer proliferation. And then um, Tecfidera, it stimulates the NRF2 pathway, which I'm sure we all talk about that over dinner, but uh, it it's, uh, may help to prevent the damage to cells caused by MS. And intravenous medications. Now, 
I mentioned Novantrone because it's still approved by the FDA as a treatment, but it's seldom used to its high side effect profile, um, but it may be reserved for very difficult cases, but it can cause problems with your heart, and it can cause problems with your blood uh, leukemia, predispose you to leukemia. It's still used for cancer in rare cases. Okay, Tysabri, everybody familiar with Tysabri? Uh, it uh, inhibits migration of white blood cells across the blood-brain barrier. Um, and then Lemtrada um, is the drug that I monitor patients on. It targets T and B cells uh, that have a CD52 uh, protein on them. And it is believed that it may reset an, your immune system to start to act normally after you receive it. Um, Tysabri is given once a month. Lemtrada is given uh, on year one for five days and a year later for three days, and it may be repeated annually if, if you need it, uh, if, if you still have disease activity. And then we have Ocrevus, and it's a IV drug, a monoclonal antibody, just like the others, and it targets B cells with a CD20 surface protein, and it's given every six months. So um, those are our IV medications. And then, now this is funny because upcoming agents, cladribine, it's now, it is Mavenclad. It, um, it's um, C-L-A-D-R-I-B-I-N-E, and Mavenclad is its, um, trade name, and it's M-A-V-E-N-C-L-A-D. M-A-V-E-N-C-L-A-D. And it was originally used for cancer therapy. Um, it's been, all, I think it's been used in Canada. Um, but it interferes with repair, repair of T and B cell lymphocytes. Um, then saponamod is a pill that's similar to Gelenia, and it was approved last week. And it is called Mayzent. M-A-Y-Z-E-N-T. Now those two drugs are, um, I believe they're for um, secondary progressive MS and relapsing remitting MS. Then uh, ofatumumab is, hasn't come out yet, but it's going to come out fairly soon. The way things are going, it might be coming out tomorrow. But it's a subcutaneous in injection and it's given every four weeks. And then there's another drug called Ibutalast, and it acts in a different way. It's used in Japan for other things. Um, I believe it has to do with uh, recovery from stroke, and it's also used for asthma. But it produces a substance called nitric oxide, so it decreases the macrophage production which macrophage are uh, uh, pro-inflammatory substances. Um, so it has a different mechanism of action. And um, I believe that ibutalast may be a, a one drug that can be used for primary progressive. Um, and then there's, they're also looking into pharmaceutic grade biotin to promote myelin synth synthesis, which we've already kind of do, are doing that. Now, everybody know about biotin and lab test? Yeah. Okay. Stop it for three days before you get any kind of lab test. A lot of times it interferes with hepatitis test and uh, thyroid test. If I'm mm -hmm. understanding you said, so the last three of those are, would be for possibly for primary progressive? Um, this uh, ibutalast is the only one. And then, uh, oh, and yeah, and then pharmaceutical grade biotin would be uh, okay for primary progressive too because well, that's for. Well, the Ocrevo just 
I oh, yes. Oh, yes. It probably is. You're right. Yes. So this, you say yeah. this is a standard test of best responsibility. Yes, because it's, it is, it's an ochrevis, fully humanized ochrevis type drug made by a different company. And I don't know how, I don't know how they're going to do it. The, um, I don't know if you're going to have to have it observed in the infusion center with your first dose or not. I haven't found that out yet. But that's new on the pike. So they're coming out with new things. Now, shared decision making is a really important part of MS treatment. And you can see the difference between Dr. Charcot standing there holding the patient up against her will in front of a bunch of people, her family aren't there, the doctor sitting there looking at people eye to eye, there's a family member there, um, they're all discussing things on equal ground, equal, um, you know, he, it, it, he respect, it looks, it shows respect for the person and not, not uh, having them on display or being paternalistic. So when we look at a person with MS, this is one of the things that Dr. Murray said. Um, you can find a lecture on the sheets that you have there. Uh, there's a link to a lecture he gave on the history of MS. But we look beyond the person with, that has MS, and we, we know everybody has a, their own personality, their own roles, relationships, their secret life, their own body, their body reacts differently to things. Um, they have different other diseases maybe that may interfere with treatment. So we, you know, we do try to look at the whole person when, when a disease modifying therapy is, is, is suggested. And um, one thing we need to know, MS is not the same disease in each patient. Agents all have differing mechanisms of actions. Individuals respond to drugs uh, differently over time, and so we have to think about changing. And I know a lot of people, Tysabri, you, after you develop your JC virus positive um, antibody, you have to change. Um, or different disease activity may make it evident that we need to ramp things up a little bit. Um, and then each person needs to weigh the risk of treatment against the risk of disease progression. And sometimes that's really a hard thing for people to do. Um, because the doctor may feel, well, if the way things are going, 10 years from now, you're not going to be doing very well. But if you feel okay, why are you going to take a chance at a drug that has potential side effects. So there's a lot of weighing that has to be done. Um, and really making a decision depends a lot on mutual trust. You have to trust the doctor, and then, and then we have to trust that you will be able to do the therapy, that, you, that it's gonna work for you, that, like in my line, I have to make sure that the patients are going to stay on board with being watched for four years after you've had your last dose. You, you, you know, I will become frequent. You will know me if you get Lemtrada because I will be on the phone or seeing you or talking frequently um, because I have to make sure you're doing okay over time. And in partnering with patients, you know, it's taken us a long f time to find this out, but people do a lot better when we partner with them, when they agree to what we uh, want to do and, and they buy into it. Um, if we force a treatment on you that you don't want, like if you don't want to do injections, you know, you may not want to do them. Um, and what are the barriers to shared de decision making? Well, sometimes people, the lack of knowledge and understanding of drugs and their, their mechanisms of actions um, make people not want to try different therapies. Um, that's one of our roles is to educate. That's why we have so much education um, and we put a big uh, priority on it here. Um, and you know, the YouTube, does anybody watch YouTube, the Dr. 
Foster has a YouTube on about anything. Um, then some barriers can be comorbidities. Um, like with Lemtrada, if you have HIV infection, even if you're really healthy and it's stable, we can't give you Lemtrada because it, you will not be able to resist the, it any longer. Um, and then number four, insurance. Insurance, um, I sit next to Tisha and she does a lot of our pre-authorizations and insurance, they have a certain idea about the way they want things done and we have to work with insurance and, and try to advocate for our patients as best we can. And another um, barrier is access to care. Um, one of the goals of this facility is to help people that need advanced therapies that live in outlying communities that don't have access to the infusion centers to give these higher level treatments, trying to help with transportation, getting people here. Um, and I know Dr. Boster and Nicholas have mentored other doctors in other communities to help them develop their own programs too. So access to care is a big issue. Um, now we talked about insurance companies. Insurance companies believe in escalation which you start on minimally effective therapies, then you work up to moderate, and then you go to high level therapies. Well, some of, a lot of people are, even the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers is starting to think some disease patterns really should start with a de-escalation with people that are young, and they have certain characteristics on their MRI and their disease history, start with the higher drugs, first. And, um, and that is kind of hard to get people to catch on, the insurance companies. Um, there's one insurance company now that's kind of starting to think towards, more towards that goal, but a lot of them aren't. So a couple, there's some clinical trials being, that are out now. And um, a lot of our clinical trials have been funded by um, Vari you know, various entities, um, but there is a Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute um, that was founded as part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. And I, what I thought was really interesting is that there, the board includes three patient and consumer representatives to help decide what direction they're going to take in research, which I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, they're still a little underrepresented. I think, um, because there's a lot more scientists and physicians, but um, we're getting in the right direction. Now this is involving a lot of different diseases, not just MS, but there are some trials of MS uh, disease modifying therapy in the um, Patient Centered Outcome Institute um, out, uh, outline. Um, and two of the studies that they talked about uh, may help guide in the selection of whether we are aggressive or traditional in the way we approach MS. And, and so when I read about this, I asked Dr. Boster, I said, well, are you guys involved with any of the, they're called PCORI trials. And Dr. Boster said that they are involved in these two. So one is deliver MS. And it is a randomized controlled study and they observe to see if the escalation approach versus the early high efficiency treatment will affect uh, change in brain volume. That's a big thing now. And now that new McDonald criteria measures that. So, so is it going to improve the brain volume or actually decrease the loss of brain volume. And the secondary measures will be how will cognition, mobility, vision, quality of life, and treatment satisfaction be affected by starting high versus escalating. So Dr. Nicholas is the primary person in this study and Dr. Boster works with her. So that's deliver MS. And then there's treat MS, which is a randomized controlled trial where standard oral or injectable therapies are compared to early aggressive di disease modifying therapies. 
and it's going on in 45 sites. And this primary outcome measure is long-term disability. So they're really kind of the same thing, but they have different measures. Um, and the secondary measure is patient reported disability, fatigue, and health cr uh, related quality of life. So Dr. Boster, that's his, he's the main man, and Dr. Nicholas is working with him. So it, 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 this one's a little bit more um, concrete measures with the deliver, and treat MS is patient, more patient subjective measures, which I think the two of them together uh, are a great thing. And this will help support, if we have data that says, wow, starting early with high, highly effective therapy is really gonna make a difference in these people's lives. It will help you know, approve therapies um, by insurance companies. And it will also help patients and doctors make the decision about, is it really worth it to, to make this risk in this drug? Because a lot of my patients going on Lemtrada are really afraid um, to take it uh, because of the risks, um, even though we have data to show that there are good outcomes. And, it, and it's scary um, to, you know, to make that decision because you don't know what the future holds. The MS doesn't have a really predictive pattern. So this is the end, and I just, you know, whenever I think about hope, I think about clouds. Every time I see the sunlight coming through, dark clouds, I keep thinking of hope. And, and I, my hope for all of you that have MS and your families is that, that we are going to come up with something in time that's going to help all of you have full, happy lives. And uh, I just feel it's an honor to be able to serve the MS community here. And, um, this is the bibliography, um, and if you are interested in um, Dr. Murray's literature uh, and his short little uh, video on the history of MS, Dr. Murray is, uh, he was kind of, I never met him, but he was very endearing in his video. This, this, it's on there, yes. Yeah. It's this, there's a couple books that I have, and this is about the books. Um, this is a big, thick, thick book that has pictures, and it's really neat. There's a lot of pictures of Dr. Charcot, and there, those people that um, I talked about, they're in, in this. And I didn't put this one on the, uh, the Biblio, because I didn't really directly quote it, but this one is by, uh, Multiple Sclerosis Through History and Human Life by Richard Swiderski. Um, and it's um, good information, but boring. I, if, if Richard Swiderski, wherever, I hope you're not watching this, but it's, it's got a lot in it, but it's, I'm a picture person, I, like you are. I like to look at pictures, and there's no pictures. None at all, but good information and condensed. And they, they both agree. You know, they, they both have a lot of the same things. But it, it, it must have been a lot of work um, that, that was done on this um, because, and I just think it was, it's, it's neat that how he is, he is an administrator of an MS program and he's also a professor of human, uh, medical humanities. I didn't tell you and that. that. And, um, did you hear uh, with, um, we were talking about it, the day when uh, the only diagnosis of MS was autopsy. And now we can detect it early when you have one lesion. Um, sometimes with uh, radi uh, radiographically isolated syndrome, you've never had any symptoms, but we watch you and it's early. It, it, we have a, a total, a total different ch shift in, in what we do. It's, you know, people are treated now. And um, when we have people diagnosed, we really try to expedite. Um, there are some times that we really 
patients have a high disease burden and we really try to move mountains to get them on a highly effective therapy because they're, they're, they have a lot of MRI disease burden. Um, and, and our doctors can see, even though sometimes the patients don't really feel that they're in immediate danger, the doctors can see by the way things are moving that 10 years from now, you're, you're going to have a significant amount of disability. So what the doctors are trying to do now is treat the you that's 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Now, I remember when I worked on a neuro floor at Ohio State in 1978, my first job in nursing, somebody had a stroke, they have a stroke. Now if you have a stroke, it's a stroke alert. And the whole hospital gets mobilized to intervene and try to prevent you from losing part of your brain to a stroke. And, and, and you know, now, and with MS, the whole philosophy is time is brain. Waiting to treat, we're going to risk you losing a valuable part of your being, your brain. And, um, and so that thing about, well, we'll see you in three years, that would never happen here. I mean, we, we would be really worried and want, you know, be calling you and I, I don't know how many times that Dr. Boster or Nicholas will say, we need to get them in here. I haven't seen them. We want to see them. We want to see how they're doing. And we have problems even in our own state too with people living in communities that have, you know, that don't have a lot of doctors and they have to travel pretty far and financial issues and um, some of the highly effective therapies do have patient assistance programs. And um, so we do have um, ways of getting people help if they can't afford the treatment. And then, and then Ohio Health has a program too. So we, we try to work and patch together things so that people don't have to suffer financially to get treatment. Because if I had to worry about getting better and the disease, I wouldn't really ha wanna have to worry about the money either. You know, because none of this is, is cheap. And actually, some of these new drugs that are coming out are pretty expensive, too. Um, I, I read somewhere, and this, is, this, wasn't a, this was just in the literature, um, uh, you know, on the regular newspaper, that um, the Mazent was going to cost about $82,000 a year. In, and then and we have um, our own financial assistance coordinator, and he, um, he works with the patients to help with therapies and um, because, and he's really busy. And when I uh, enroll new patients, they get my card and his card, and you know who they, they're calling first. <laughs> right, you have to. Yeah, both too, I, I'm reachable through my chart, so, you know, th but um, he calls them and helps them and, yep. and um, so, but we, you know, we've got a team here for you guys, and, uh, but I plan on coming back in September, so if there's anything that, um, about advanced therapies that you'd be interested in, um, you can let them know, and if I don't know anything about it, I have a lot of people I can get information. I can synthesize the information for you. I wasn't, I was really interested in the history of medicine before this, but I didn't know much about the history of MS. It was a pleasure seeing you guys, and, <laughs> and I thank you for the job you're doing in fighting your disease and the families that support and, and the people that do it without support.